Hey folks, it's Jean Dar, that science guy from the Great Lakes Science Center. So excited to be with you today. You know, we are celebrating a historic milestone. I'm talking about 20 years of continuous human presence aboard the International Space Station. I'm here inside the NASA Glenn Visitor Center in the heart of the Great Lakes Science Center. And today I'm joined by a very special guest. Now joining us is David DeFelice. He's the Deputy Chief of the Office of Communications at the NASA Glenn Research Center. Now, David is a longtime public affairs professional who joined the staff of NASA Glenn Research Center back in 1985. And during his rich career, David has served as a project manager for NASA's national touring exhibit for the Centennial Flight, several NASA open house events, and the Ohio celebration of NASA's 50th anniversary. He's also overseen NASA Glenn's web presence and has been a regular contributor on social media. Welcome, David. And if you've got a few moments, could you tell us about the role that the NASA Glenn Research Center has played and continues to play in supporting the International Space Station? Well, thank you for the, the kind introduction, John Dar. It's great to, uh, to see you and uh, to, to be a part of this uh, great weekend event. Wish uh, more than anything I could be down there with you, but uh, we are uh, still working hard at NASA Glenn. Uh, we are mostly working in a, in a telework status uh, just to kind of minimize uh, our, our risk and exposure. We do have some folks on site working on some, uh, some really mission critical things, including keeping the International Space Station uh, operating. I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the ways that we're doing that, uh, including uh, science investigations. So I've got a, a presentation to share. So uh, some images, because uh, uh, as I say, a picture is worth a thousand words, but really appreciate the Great Lakes Science Center and they're serving as our, uh, our NASA Glenn Visitor Center and uh, appreciate folks who've taken the time to come out and celebrate this uh, uh, historic anniversary. So here we go. And so it's this is the logo for the ISS 20th anniversary. And I'm um, just glad to be with you. Uh, the actual anniversary was on uh, Monday, that's uh, November uh, the second, and that was the actual anniversary of when the first crew arrived, we call them Expedition One, aboard the International Space Station. But a lot of work went up to that leading up to it. And just in the broader context, this is uh, part of NASA's uh, our exploration uh, with humans in space, a, a proud tradition that goes all the way back to our namesake, uh, even before him, but uh, John Glenn was the first American to uh, orbit uh, the Earth aboard his Mercury Friendship 7 capsule. And we're always proud to, uh, for our center and our visitor center to, uh, to bear his name. But the main uh, uh, thrust hasn't changed, leading discovery and proving life on Earth. That's what we are at NASA in terms of our humans in space. So as I mentioned, 20 years on the International Space Station. It's an unbroken streak of human presence in space. And if you got to hear uh, uh, astronaut Doug Wheelock's uh, talk uh, earlier, um, or you might hear it coming up, um, you'll hear one of the stories that he actually had to do some emergency spacewalks that if that had not gone well, that uh, unbroken streak would have been broken about 10 years into it. And so uh, it's been a lot of effort, a lot of folks working hard to uh, to get our astronauts uh, into space and to keep them there and having them do meaningful work. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I want to start out with some uh, some fun facts and figures about the International Space Station. It was built over 41 assembly flights between 1998 and two, uh, 2011. Um, that's a combination of flights and launches by the uh, by the Russians and the Americans, most of which was done uh, using the U.S. space shuttle and crews that actually would conduct spacewalks and to build it. And you can see there's enough uh, in interior living space for about the same as a six-bedroom house. It orbits the Earth 16 times per day. So that means every um, 90 minutes or so, you get a sunrise, and then you get 45 minutes later, you get a sunset. So it's kind of uh, amazing that way. And the path that it's on actually goes over 90% of the Earth's population. And later on, I'll talk to you about how you can see the space station from a, you know, backyard. One of the areas that NASA Glenn worked on was the power system, and it's powered using the, the power of the sunlight, um, solar cells that convert sunlight into electricity. And there's over 260,000 solar cells uh, on it and uh, covering the rays. And you can see the, the size and the dimensions. And if you see the banner over my shoulder there, you can see it's about the size of a football field. So it's a massive, the most large 
complex uh, endeavor ever taken on uh, in terms of uh, space exploration, really just engineering in general. It's an amazing feat. And uh, it does travel about 250 miles above the Earth at 17,500 miles per hour. Some uh, other fun facts about humans on the space station. Um, uh, the record for the longest uh, space flight was, uh, for, by a female was Christina Cook. You can see pictures there on the left, you know, along with some of her crewmates. And just some of the fun numbers, uh, 63,000 meals that they've eaten. Uh, it's built to house a, a crew from either three to up to nine. And uh, with the uh, starting of the, uh, the Crew-1 expedition uh, launching on SpaceX in about a week or so, um, <clears throat> they'll be having uh, larger crews up there. Um, that'll be about the crew of seven. And uh, so it's a great capacity there. And uh, over 225 spacewalks have been conducted in terms of construction, maintenance, upgrades to the space station since they started in 1998. And uh, those continue on now. So the mission of the International Space Station is to, to build international commercial human exploration partnerships. And that's been great. And we're going to carry those partnerships on into our new Artemis effort. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, enable long duration uh, human spaceflight beyond low Earth orbit. And that's where the space station operates. But we want to get back uh, to the moon and onto Mars. And then return the benefits to humanity through our basic and applied research. And I'll go into details on that. And then facilitate the commercial development of, uh, of business uh, in low Earth orbit. And there's been great successes in that area. So the space station is a unique place and a convergence of science and technology, human innovation, we're making breakthroughs that uh, demonstrate various new capabilities that just wouldn't be possible on Earth. And uh, so just a quick thing, a lot of people think, hey, you're out in space, there's no gravity. Well, actually there is gravity. Gravity is what keeps the uh, space station in orbit around the Earth. It's the same thing that keeps the moon orbiting around the Earth as well. But there's a phenomenon called free fall. And if you haven't checked it out yet, check out the drop tower in the, um, this, the Discover Gallery of the Visitor Center. You can get a feel for how we create free fall even here on Earth and how that creates the weightless environment, which uh, makes uh, this incredible research impossible, makes life uh, totally amazing on the space station. So here's just a recap of the, uh, the launches and the assembly of the International Space Station, starting with the uh, Russian Zarya and the uh, American Unity modules uh, docking together in 1998, the added addition of the Destiny Lab and then the Harmony module, uh, the uh, Russian, excuse me, the European and the Japanese modules in 2008, and the uh, uh, Tranquility node as well. And now that's what the space station looks like, all complete there. So there's a, uh, just a quick overview of the contributions uh, NASA Glenn Research Center has made in terms of establishing and operating the space station. I just can go into each one of those just a little bit uh, of detail so you get an appreciation for uh, the great work the uh, men and women of NASA Glenn have done uh, leading up to and throughout the 20 year history of the International Space Station. One of the areas is electrical power system design and development. In the upper left hand corner, you see a, a solar array being tested in one of our vacuum chambers. That very same solar array is on display in that middle pic picture. That's on display in the Discovery Gallery in the Power Lab. We actually were able to uh, hold on to that and put that on display and get a, a feel for um, how we do that. And there's some hands-on activities where you can experiment. Uh, the, the picture on the uh, lower right there is the uh, the solar radiators, all that sunlight hitting uh, the solar rays. We have to make sure we manage the, the temperatures there. And so we have uh, the, the solar rays facing the sun and then we have these radiators facing away from the sun out to deep space to get rid of the excess heat. Another interesting area is the uh, analysis of the power system. Uh, you can see one of the uh, cargo ships uh, from SpaceX coming and docking. When the ships come, you can see in the lower ha right hand, they'll actually cast shadows and block sunlight. <clears throat> we have to understand how the power um, is going to be affected by all these docking spaceships and coming and going and keeping the solar rays pointed towards the sun for optimal performance that way. So that's a, an ongoing analysis, and that analysis is done before anything is docked and during just to make sure uh, there's no be, be no uh, significant loss of performance there. So lots of benefits um, of research on the space station. We've done over 2,800 experiments and technology demonstrations, um, <clears throat> excuse me, counting uh, through March of 2019, and the list continues to grow. 
And these give us scientific advancement, um, enabling future exploration, expanding commerce, great benefits for humanity, and of course, great inspiration and education for uh, young generations to uh, continue their research. Scientific advancements, these are some of the areas that we work on uh, from NASA Glenn Research Center. Our two main areas are the cool flames, uh, or excuse me, I should say combustion experiments in general. And you see a cool flame experiment there actually lighting a fire in space. And you can see, instead of getting the typical kind of uh, candle flame we're used to seeing that's driven by gravity and the convection flow of the warm air around it going up, we tend to get more spherical flames. And combustion um, is responsible for about 80% of our energy use on Earth. So if we can understand and improve efficiencies um, by doing our research in space, it can have a great uh, dividends and benefits um, for life on Earth <clears throat> in terms of efficiency, uh, reducing emissions so we can improve our environment. And then fluid flow is a, a very uh, challenging uh, activity. Um, you can't you know, just open up a valve and have water flow out of the bottom of a tank because the water may not be at the bottom of the tank. It tends to wet and surround. And the same thing is true with a, a rocket. If you just uh, if you've been floating out in space, you want to launch a rocket. If you don't position the fluid properly or have a device to acquire it, you're going to try to light up your rocket engine and just going to sputter because the fuel's not coming out. It's going to start sucking the, uh, the, the vapors out of the, uh, the tank because they could be positioned anywhere. <clears throat> and there's uh, all kinds of materials in terms of uh, colloids and things like you know paints and things and even simple thing like a salad dressing. We're used to it settling here on Earth. Uh, like an oil and vinegar dressing with all the herbs and spices. And uh, so that's one of the nice things on the space station. You don't have to necessarily shake your salad dressing because it's going to stay in position, but that can be very detrimental to some other materials and processes. So advanced materials is another area. There's a, a, an activity, uh, an ongoing research program that Glenn's participated in called the Materials International Space Station Experiment, or MISI as we call it. And it demonstrates the durability uh, of various materials in a punishing environment of space. And you can actually see uh, the, one of the MISI trays exposed to uh, the uh, exterior, on um, the exterior space station exposed to space. And we actually have one of those uh, smaller sample trays on display in the Discover Gallery as well. So you can see that, but you can see the, um, the long uh, duration ex effects of the sunlight, atomic oxygen, uh, just the harsh environment of space. So we can have new and improved materials for use for uh, long duration space missions, either in low Earth orbit or even beyond. Enabling space exploration uh, in other ways is keeping our, our astronauts healthy in terms of everything, in terms of their, uh, uh, their muscle mass and bone density, those types of things. On the left, you see a picture of our exercise countermeasure lab and our, uh, our special treadmill um, that we use. And basically, we suspend uh, a, a test subject kind of like a, a puppet on strings and uh, to kind of take gravity <clears throat> out of the equation and the treadmill is horizontal. And what that simulates is what you see on the right. You see our friend uh, Sunny Williams on a treadmill and she's using a harness that was designed by the researchers at Glenn in that facility because the first expeditions, including Sunny's first trip on well, her first expedition at the space station, uh, she actually ran the Boston Marathon in space. But imagine three hours or so running in a treadmill, she was getting uh, chafing and discomfort and so through the feedback and having some of the astronauts uh, train in our treadmill, we're able to redesign that harness that keeps them in contact with the treadmill so they can do their exercises. So it's a great advancement and those will pay dividends for uh, our future exploration as well. And as I talked about uh, future exploration, um, it's essential for Artemis. Artemis is our mission to send the, the first woman and the next man to the surface of the moon. We're planning to do that by 2024 and to get them to the uh, so the equatorial region where Apollo was down to the, uh, the south pole of the moon. And you may have seen the recent news about uh, finding uh, uh, more evidence of water on the surface of the moon, and that's really important. And it's just some of the areas that space station is supporting is advanced technology, human research, life support systems, uh, spacesuit testing, and uh, the crew and human performance uh, types of things that we've already touched on. So you can see how they all help advance. Um, one of those areas, technology areas, is advanced communication. There was something called the Space Communications Navigation Testbed um, that I believe was 2012 that we uh, launched and. Uh, on a Japanese rocket through our partners uh, with the Japanese Space Agency. And uh, they launched it, we deployed it, put it outside the space station. And we're actually, uh, you can see it there on the right, deployed an external platform and we can run through a series 
of uh, testing of different communications protocols to advance our abilities to uh, to do tech, um, to do uh, space communications because uh, that's a critical part of uh, going out and doing exploration to be able to communicate quickly and getting higher data rate transmissions and those types of things things that we take for advantage uh, for uh, granted here on the Earth. International Space Station is uh, is paving the way for uh, to the moon and Mars, and we're working with our international partners. That's been a great benefit we've had from the space station. We've just signed some more agreements with the international partners. They want to be heavily involved with return trip to the moon. It's not just going to be an American effort the way Apollo was. It's going to be international uh, effort again, and and we are going. It's exciting. It's getting ready. We're uh, getting ready to, to do uh, some testing of our space launch system rocket. They call it the, the green run test of the, the engines of that. And that's using you know liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen technology, technology that was advanced by NASA Glenn uh, over our 80 year history. Um, it's just uh, amazing to see that uh, come together. And I promised talking about being able to see the space station in your background, the backyard, you can do it without a telescope. Uh, binoculars might help you a little bit to see a little closer, you can see a little bit of the outline, but you can get notifications and alerts by going to spotthestation.nasa.gov. And I went ahead and did a little research for you and found uh, some couple sighting opportunities. And it tends to go in cycles. Right now we're in an early morning cycle. Give it another couple weeks and it'll be more like a, an early mid evening type of cycle. So it's always gonna be typically within an hour before sunrise or about an hour after sunset. So that the space station's high enough above the earth that it's in the sunlight, but we're it's dark enough that we can see it fly overhead. So you can see some opportunities there. If you need some help interpreting those numbers, there's a chart that we uh, I helped develop a few years ago that's on spot the station at NASA.gov, and it'll help you to uh, um, understand those numbers. You can sign up to get email or, or text alerts as well. So uh, that's it. We're uh, happy to celebrate 20 years of humans in space. You can get a lot more information going to www.nasa.gov slash station. So that's it. Thank you uh, for sharing. And if you uh, have any uh, questions, John Dar, I'd be glad to try to ask, answer them. David, this is uh, this is so cool. Um, you've certainly piqued my interest as we were talking about the Artemis program. When do we expect to see the first launch of that uh, of that new vehicle? We're, we're targeting for an unmanned launch by the end of uh, next year, end of 2021. So this uh, green run test is really important. That's happening down at our NASA Dennis Space Center in uh, Mississippi. And uh, fortunately, the hurricanes haven't delayed that too much. It's been a, uh, a rough season down for them along the Gulf Coast, but they are on target to do that. And so that'll be uncrewed tests, which we'll is kind of go and do a basic profile. And then the first mission with the crew will be a couple years after that uh, using the Orion capsule. Um, with the crew in it. We're going to send them on a very similar mission to Apollo 8 out and around the moon and then come back again. And then 2024, uh, we're working on the human landing system to be able to actually get them uh, onto the surface of the moon. Boy, that is so exciting, David. Um, it, now, we've got a lot of visitors here. Many of the young people want to grow up and uh, and work at NASA one day. What are some mm -hmm. of the what are the, some of the uh, positions, some of the job openings that uh, that might be available to them? Okay, here at NASA Glenn, we have about 3,200 employees, about half of them, about 1,600, are scientists and engineers. Um, so that is like the, the, the best way career path. And uh, my actually uh, degree out of college is mechanical engineering. And I've always said it's kind of the best first degree you can have. You can move on and do other things if you want. But uh, um, it takes a you know proficiency in, in science and math in those areas. You get to build things, design things, do the types of things we're talking about. So that's the, the best surefire way. But there's all kinds of career fields at NASA. We have people who uh, support our logistics. Uh, communications professionals, the area I'm in now, uh, folks who help with, uh, we have got lawyers and medical personnel, uh, accountants that help us do all the, the things that we do. Um, so the idea is to work hard at school, uh, be the best you can be at what you do. And, uh, and certainly if you aspire to be an astronaut, that's a, a great idea as well. Um, be a, an advanced in your field and all these areas, it's always good to, to take care of your body, be in good health and um, you have great opportunities. Wow, that's great. David, thank you so much for joining us. We are certainly proud to be your partner and, the, uh, and to be the home to the NASA Glenn Visitor Center right here at the Great Lakes Science Center. So uh, on behalf of all of us here, thank you for joining us and helping us to celebrate 20 years of continuous human presence aboard the International Space Station. 
Folks, if you haven't already done so, please make sure that you uh, that you stop by the Discover Gallery here at the Great Lakes Science Center. Uh, David spoke of several exhibits that talk specifically about what NASA Glenn is doing to help promote space exploration. You certainly want to get in there and check that out. And don't forget, we've got fantastic shows, some great uh, hands-on cart activities, and of course, you can get all the swag you can carry while you're here at the Great Lakes Science Center. I'm Jean Dar, that science guy. David has joined us, David DeFelice, Deputy Chief of Communications at the NASA Glenn Research Center. Thank you My all. Pleasure. We'll see you around the Science Center. Remember, stay curious.